Ah, Persona 3, one of my favorite games, and chock full of amazing gospel symbols and parallels. I'm Clark, and welcome to Gospel Centered Gaming, the only channel where Jesus saves our games and our lives. Hey, uh. Awake. Persona 3 is a classic JRPG of the Shin Megami Tensei variety, produced by Atlas, and is in the same line of games as the one everyone's talking about now, Persona 5, or Persona 5 Royal. Gee, who would have guessed that? Set in 2009-10, to you play as a high school student who signs a mysterious contract and can suddenly summon monsters to fight black blobs with beady red eyes while the best BGM ever plays in the background. Awesome! But today we are not focusing on gameplay, but narrative, which is where the game truly shines. Particularly, we are searching for instances of God's presence throughout the narrative, whether they be obvious or hidden, straight references or symbolic. And let me tell you, this game, it's just like the title says, obvious symbolism is obvious. Now I can't promise that the parallels are perfect, but that's not the point. We are trying to see where, if anywhere, the gospel narrative shines through this story. If you're further interested in the guiding principles, vision, and mission of this show, you can check out the channel trailer, link in the top right corner. Because Persona 3 is such a long beast to tackle, I decided to break this series into sections for easier digestion. Since most of the content is based in the main character's relations to other characters, I've divided the series by characters. We will be reviewing things that each character does and says and is associated with to determine where and what of the gospel narrative of eternal redemption through Jesus Christ can be found. If there are any particular characters you'd like to look at, check out the playlist in the description or the top right corner. And for those of you who have not played or completed this game, I give you fair warning now that there will be a plethora of spoilers. I highly recommend playing this game for yourself, and I implore you to please save this series, especially this first video, for after you have played it through at least once. You'll thank me later. Now without further ado, let's go. This first video is going to focus on the meat and potatoes of the game, the main character. Orphaned as a child after his parents died in a car crash that he survived, he enters Gecko Khan High and starts living at the dorms. It is during his first week there that he awakens to his mysterious persona powers, and soon after becomes the assault leader of Seize, the specialized extracurricular execution squad, which is a front for a shadow fighting team of teenagers. Mostly teenagers. We'll get to that. This character is the messiah figure of this world. In other words, for our purposes, he represents Jesus. For those not aware, Jesus is the Christian God, the fully human yet fully divine man-god who walked this earth, died on the cross, and rose from the grave to live again. Why did he do this? To put it simply, because all humans apart from Jesus have disobeyed God in heart, mind, and action, we were set to be judged and condemned with a sentence of eternal separation from God, aka eternal death. But Jesus, in his loving nature and great desire to share his love with us, laid his life down as a pure, clean, and eternal sacrifice to pay the price cover the cost we had accrued with our disobedience. He took on our sentence of death as his own, though he did not deserve it, and went EVEN FURTHER BEYOND to then rise from the dead, conquering death itself and providing for all who believe in him and follow him eternal life. And what is eternal life? Simply to know God, Jesus Christ. In knowing him, we live forever. Hallelujah! Now, back to the game. The main character of Persona 3 goes through parallels of several of the significant events of Jesus' life. In a broad sense, the main character goes through the same main acts of Jesus' life and ministry. Crucifixion, death, resurrection, and ascension. The order of these events, however, is not the same. I will be jumping a bit from topic to topic, but I'll try to keep things clear and concise. The first and most jarring of these events is his literal crucifixion. Like I said, obvious symbolism is obvious. Ikutsuki, the chairman of Seas, betrays Seas and literally crucifies all of its members in an attempt to sacrifice them to Nyx, the goddess of death. Unlike Jesus, however, he did not die during this event. Instead, he dies as a result of his final battle with Nyx, 
the entire sequence of events from January 31st to the end of the game are chock full of biblical symbolism pertaining to Jesus' ministry. To keep it summarized, after the battle with the Nyx avatar, Nyx's representative on Earth, he ascends to the moon to have a final bout with Nyx. He then performs the Great Seal in order to defeat her. As a result of defeating her, he dies a few months afterward. It is then revealed in the Answer expansion of FES that he was the seal, literally positioning himself between Nyx and the Earth, forever preventing her from becoming unleashed again. Let's look at these events a little more closely for some juicy gospel goodness. First, his ascension. This event is symbolic of Jesus' ascension after his death. During the cutscene, we see that all the Seas members are weighed down by a mysterious weight emanating from Nyx. I have dubbed this the Weight of Death. We see from these events that only the main character could overcome the Weight of Death, and furthermore completely overpowered it by ascending to the heavens despite its power. In our world, only Jesus has that sort of power, to completely overwhelm the power of sin, death, and hell. Second, his fight with Nyx. First of all, before the battle even begins, the main character did not wait for Nyx to come down to Earth, but went up to the moon, Nyx's domain, to fight her. Similarly, Jesus did not stay in heaven waiting for us, but came from heaven to Earth to save us. Both narratives show a pattern of leaving the familiar and rightful place of the Messiah to save everyone. The main character in facing Nyx is also standing between Nyx and the Earth as a defense for the people. Jesus also stood against hell and received the punishment of our sins, meant for us. Both narratives here show a theme of standing between the enemy and the people for the people's sake. We see this theme again for the main character later when he stands between Tartarus and the Earth as Tartarus disintegrates. Then, once the battle commences, we see a few turns of exchange between Nyx and the main character. Nyx hits the main character four times, and I think we can see these as parallel attempts of the enemy to kill the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the three persons of the Trinity. The first hit brings him down to 1 HP, and the second hits him, but he remains at 1 HP. I liken these to attacks directed at the Son, Jesus. Death did wound Jesus, as his passion so adequately shows us, but Jesus was not struck down. Jesus gave up his life willingly, as we will discuss a bit later. As such, death did not defeat Jesus, and we can say that it only wounded him. The third hit misses him. I believe this hit is directed at God the Father. God the Father is too far removed from death for him to touch him, and as such, death misses. God and sin cannot coexist in the same space, and therefore death, the matured result of sin, cannot even come near to him, let alone hit him. This is not to say that God is distant from us. For he walked among us as Jesus, and now dwells with believers as the Holy Spirit. But Jesus himself states that God is in heaven during the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, 9-13. And heaven is a place without sin or death, sorrow or suffering. Death cannot enter his domain, and thus it misses him. The fourth and final hit Nyx tries on the main character is blocked. This final hit is toward the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is often described as the very presence of God, which gives men and women supernatural abilities. Relevant abilities to this narrative are strength, such as in the case of Samson, physical endurance, such as in the case of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and spiritual endurance, as the author of Hebrews calls us to. The power of the Holy Spirit allows us to withstand the beratements and bashings of hell, as the main character did here. After Nyx's failed attempts to defeat him, the main character uses the Great Seal, which, as described, unleashes the power within you to seal Nyx. Only Jesus Christ has the power to defeat death, and he did. When the main character unleashes his messianic power, he points up as if to heaven and defeats Nyx, once and for all. If these points haven't made it clear, the main character is very powerful. Mama, the fortune teller in the Escapade Club, tells us in her last fortune, which you can only access after you have defeated Nyx, the universe is within you, and you are within the universe. You and the universe are one and the same. That is my belief. While this is definitely an Eastern religious notion, we can parallel this idea to Jesus' quote from Matthew 28:18. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, which he states after his resurrection. 
i.e. after he defeated Death. To push this point of power home, we find out when we defeat the last giant shadow that he had literal death sealed inside him by Aegis. This would have killed a normal person, but instead he overpowered it and even controlled it as evidenced by his wielding of the persona Thanatos, the son of Nyx. Speaking of personas, let's talk about the main character's main personas, Orpheus, Thanatos, and Messiah. Orpheus, the first persona the main character awakens to, is of the Fool Arcana. Very simply, this can be a reference to Jesus' life, words, and ministry being seen as foolish by the world and its standards. During the first battle, Orpheus transforms into Thanatos, or to put it more accurately, Thanatos forcibly pushes himself out of Orpheus' oral cavity. Kinda gross. But he beat the crap out of the first boss shadow, and that's pretty cool. Regardless, this is clearly referencing the fact that the main character had death sealed inside him, which as we've already discussed demonstrates the power of the main character. But I want to take a moment to focus on how Orpheus and Thanatos relate to each other. I personally think this point is one of the coolest. Let's look at Isaiah 25.8 in the KJV. He will swallow up death in victory. This quote makes the regurgitation imagery from before more fascinating. Fascinating. If Thanatos, the son of the goddess of death, came out of Orpheus's mouth, it was obviously inside him. Swallowed, you might say. Death was swallowed by the fool. This same kind of imagery and language is used by the Apostle Paul, one of the core inspired writers of the New Testament in 1 Corinthians. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And then later in chapter 15, quoting Isaiah 28:5, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? This is all to say that Christ in his victory on the cross conquered death and swallowed it, taking away its sting and making it subject to God. Now, death, the enemy and antithesis of the God of life, Jesus Christ, is the means by which we enter into heaven with him forever. That is absolutely amazing! No wonder the passion, death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ is considered a divine mystery, for it leaves us so much to ponder and reflect upon. So to wrap up this point, the whole thing with Thanatos coming out of Orpheus parallels the spiritual reality that Jesus, the victorious fool, has swallowed up death. Now to follow up with a much less cool, but still kinda cool, little tidbit I noticed. When the main character first summons Orpheus, his eyes turn blue. In fact, the same kind of blue as the eyes of another character, Pharos. We'll talk more about him in another video, but this is also referencing the fact that death is sealed within the main character. Despite all our talk about Orpheus and Thanatos, the main character's true persona is Messiah. He is the final persona the main character can summon, excluding Orpheus Telos, and he is summoned by fusing both Orpheus and Thanatos together. This again is referencing the world's view of Christ's death as foolish, and that death is swallowed by the victorious fool, Christ. But we know the truth, that his death and resurrection has brought us eternal life. Praise be to God! Got a little carried away there, but I don't care! On top of this, many of Messiah's design details are direct references or allusions to Jesus. He is all white. This represents purity. He has a long plank all along his back, which can easily be referencing the cross. He belongs to the Judgment Arcana, for Jesus is the true and righteous judge. There are coffins chained to him, off to his side. This shows that he is above and has conquered death. Yet they are still attached to him, as evidenced by the chains around his left wrist and forearm, for Jesus took upon himself our sin and brokenness on the cross. Some of his abilities, too, reference the Gospel. He can learn Absorb Pierce, which is a reference to Jesus' side being pierced with a spear after his death on the cross. He can learn Salvation, which restores all party members' health fully and cures all status ailments. 
This one's pretty obvious, but it also fits nicely with Malachi 4.2 KJV and Isaiah 53.5, which says respectively, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And, But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Lastly, he learns Enduring Soul, which restores all HP upon death once per battle. This can very easily be seen as a reference to Jesus' resurrection. Also, one last little tidbit about Messiah. When you summon him, his quote is, I am Messiah, from this day forth I shall be with you. This fits very nicely with the biblical theme of God being with us, as Jesus tells his disciples, And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age, in Matthew 28, 20. And be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you, in Deuteronomy 31, 6. Two of my personal favorite verses. In fact, Emmanuel, one of the names for Jesus, means God with us. As the main character, you even have a dialogue option during your final team meeting to say, I'm with you, which is totally something Jesus would say to reassure his disciples. Lastly, months after the main character returns to Earth from his battle, he dies in a very emotional scene as he is held by Aegis. During the events of the answer, we find out that he had actually used himself as the seal to keep Nyx at bay forevermore. This act brings up four fascinating points. First, it brings up Jesus' role as our eternal intercessor. An intercessor stands between one person and another and advocates for the one in need. And in common vernacular, an intercessor is someone who prays to God for another person. Paul explains in Romans 8.34 that Jesus as the Son of God at God's right hand is interceding for us eternally, even now as you're watching this video. Because he received the punishment meant for us, all of God's wrathful judgment goes upon Jesus, freeing us from condemnation. Because of his death, we get to live. And now while we are alive, Jesus himself is interceding for us, praying to the Father on our behalf. Second, it brings up the concept of humble giving, something Jesus talks about in Matthew 6.3 when he says, But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. The reason I bring this up is the way the main character dies. It reminds me of this sentence. He gave his life to become the eternal intercessor, holding Nyx back from killing everyone and everything. Yet, he still came back to Earth alive for a little while longer. How? Well, the way I see it, while his spirit took its place as eternal intercessor for the world and conqueror of death, his flesh was yet to die and was even unaware of what was happening, at least up until the very last scene on the rooftop. So, while his spirit, his right hand, gave, his flesh, his left hand, knew not what happened. Third, it brings up a concept introduced by Jesus in John 10, 17-18, in which he states, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Jesus was not killed, but willingly laid down his life. In other words, he allowed himself to go through the passion and ultimately died on the cross of his own volition. This is also evidenced in Matthew 26, 53-54, when he states, Do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and he will at once send more than twelve legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled? That it must be so. Jesus could have at any moment saved himself from such a horrible punishment and demise, but he chose to endure it for the glory set before him and for our sakes, that we may be saved. Similarly, the main character of this game was not killed by Nyx in their final battle, but he rather laid down his life to save and protect the world from Nyx, the goddess of death, forevermore. For the fourth point, let me do a little more explaining. In the answer, we find out that the main character became the Great Seal not to prevent Nyx from coming to Earth of her own will, but to prevent the will of men and women who desired death from reaching out to her and inviting her to Earth. This makes sense biblically, as scripture reminds us that in our human nature, we desire wickedness, inviting death with our wicked words and actions. Jesus, however, does not prevent us from experiencing eternal death as the main character of this game does. He does quite the opposite. 
We cannot save ourselves from the weight of our sins, so Jesus died that we may be saved. But we have every right to reject him. Instead of forcing compliance, Jesus tells us the truth, that it is through believing in and following him that we may live eternally, and leaves it to us whether we will accept the truth and be in his presence, which is life forever, or reject the truth and experience eternity apart from him, which is eternal death. Jesus respects our autonomy. So, both the main character and Jesus recognize the hopeless situation of mankind without a savior, and they go about saving them in similar fashions, but the end result is slightly different. While that does it for the main points, there are several smaller points that strengthen the parallels between the main character and Jesus. During his battle with Nyx, the members of Seas cry out in belief in the main character's ability to defeat Nyx. These cries can be seen in a sense as a kind of prayer. These prayers, along with the social links he has made throughout the journey, imbue him with power. While our prayers do not imbue God with strength, for he is almighty without our help, we do pray to him. The main character is seen throughout the story giving hope and confidence to other people. A few examples include a conversation with Mitsuru on January 22nd after future consultation. If you choose, I can only think about Nyx. She declares, after we defeat Nyx, our lives will continue on, so you should think about your future. As Mitsuru is not one to mince her words, she meant what she said with that connotation of hope for victory. In a similar way, believers can have confidence in the victory of Christ over sin, death, and the enemy, which he won on the cross and through his resurrection. Another example is a conversation with the Port Island station manager, in which he states his doubt that things will return to normal. If you respond with, of course it will, he starts to rethink his doubts. Jesus had hope when others did not, because he knew the victory to come, and he shared this hope with others, which is what the main character is doing here, too. Another example is Yukari talking with the main character on January 26th. She states, Oh hey, only five days until the promised day. Well, we're going there to break that promise. In Christ, we can confidently break the quote-unquote promises of the enemy and replace them with the truth which is the promises of Christ. Last example I'll show is a conversation with Aegis on January 27th. I don't quite understand what it means to live yet, so my career counseling was really confusing, but I know that if I'm with you, everything will be okay. Pure and simple, as long as we're with Christ, we can rest assured that he will work things out for good. The main character also gives life. We can see him preserving life by saving Yukari and Junpei during the first full moon mission, and they recognize that it is because of him that they are alive. But this point is more powerfully demonstrated in a conversation with Aegis on January 25th. I don't know what it means to live yet, but I want to learn the answer. So please, please take me with you. Aegis is recognizing that the main character is the one that gives life and holds the key to the meaning of life. In reality, Jesus is that person. As he states, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This scene is also reminiscent of John 13, 36, in which Peter asks Jesus where he is going, and Jesus responds, Where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. The main character can see things that other characters don't, namely the Velvet Room. This shows his spiritual attunement, knowledge, and giftedness, which Jesus, we can certainly assume, exemplified most highly in our world. The MC can hold up to 12 personas at once. Jesus had 12 disciples. The main character can also create up to 170 different personas. Jesus is the originator of personality as we are made in his image and not the other way around. So it makes sense that the main character can have so many personas of so many different types with different advantages and disadvantages, similar and dissimilar to other characters' personas. He cannot, however, summon other people's personas, showing that he is inherently different from them. Also, while he can create many different personas, he has one true persona, which is Messiah. This shows that while he can exemplify the many human personality traits that exist, his ultimate identity is not humanly, but godly, Messiah. In the same way, Jesus can show many characteristics that we understand as human because they started with him and not with us, but he is ultimately God our savior as much as he is human as well. The main character says very little, while Jesus also said only what was necessary. The main character was tempted. Jesus was also tempted in the wilderness 40 days after his baptism. Neither succumbed to it. 
Lastly, both the main character and Jesus also first appear to women. More specifically, the main character first appears to Yukari and Mitsuru when he enters the dorm, and Jesus first appears to women after his resurrection. Of course, the parallel isn't perfect. Two major contradictions are as follows. Your face is so emotionless. I never know what you're thinking. This is something Mitsuru says to the main character on October 24th. It is a common misconception that Jesus and Christianity are emotionless, but Jesus was in fact very emotional. Below I am citing just a few examples. Second, some of the personas the main character can summon are of demonic origin, such as Satan, Lucifer, Hillel, Abaddon, Samael, Beelzebul, etc. As is established in Mark 3, 22-27, Jesus does not have power from demonic origin, but holy origin, for he is the one true God. Hallelujah and Amen. Phew! Oh my gosh. I knew I had a lot of notes for this guy, but I didn't realize how much I had written down. I promise that the next videos to follow are definitely a lot shorter. Like, not past 20 minutes. <laughs> definitely not. Uh, there's just not as much on them that I could find or, you know, think about as this main character, which is just so much. Next time, the video is probably going to be a lot shorter. Um, and the next video, we're going to start focusing on the members of C's, starting with Yukari and Junpei. Um, I'll probably throw in another character in there too, but so stick around. V you know, the next video should be out in about a week or so. And yeah, be looking forward to that. If you liked this video, please, you know, the YouTube thing, please like, comment, and subscribe so you can always find more. Make sure you ring that bell by clicking on it so that you get notifications when the next video comes out so you can watch it as soon as you want. All right. Thank you guys so much for watching and listening. This was my first time doing this kind of project and, you know, it's been a journey so i'm looking forward to releasing more content for you all and definitely please leave some constructive comments in the comments section uh, i would love feedback since this is my first time doing something like this and i look forward to great improvement um and yeah spreading the word of god in this way and you know helping people to enjoy the things that they love in a different way so yeah thank you all so much god bless you and i hope that you all have an amazingly wonderfully blessed day